All right, welcome. Thank you for tuning in. This is my YouTube series, This Is Not a Snow Day. Started when we had the pandemic and we wanted to treat it like it was something different. And now we live in a world where we have a lot to talk about and it might be bigger than uh, creating a classroom in the corner of your kitchen. So as I have reflected and read and listened this week, I realized that I can use this platform to echo and amplify other voices. And so one of the first people I reached out to was a friend, a colleague, in many ways a mentor who's helped me in my journey with understanding racism and anti-racism, Dr. Aaron Johnson. So Aaron, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Absolutely, absolutely. So I'm going to allow you, I'm not going to allow, I would ask you to please introduce yourself and, and let us know who you are and where you come from. Awesome. Well, um, like Kevin said, my name is Aaron Johnson. Uh, I'm an educator. I am a, um, a teacher. Uh, I'm a teacher of teachers. <laughs> um, uh, but most importantly, I'm a husband and a dad. And um, those are the, the jobs that I take uh, so seriously enough that I try to conduct myself the way I would with my own family members, with um, people within our profession, with, with kids in our schools. That I, I, I see my son and my daughters and a lot of them, and I want to make sure that any, any school environment that I would um, make better for my own kids, I would make better for everyone else's kids as well. Um, I grew up in the city of Detroit, um, and absolutely, I, I love, I still love the city, still love the city. Um, I have a relationship with the city of Detroit, that's a <laughs> <people. I'm laughs> in relationship. Absolutely. Um, I grew up in the city of Detroit, and, um, you know, much of what you might hear about the city or even the, uh, the public schools in the city um are, are are not true at least from the perspective of those who have gone through it and, and so uh, i received an excellent education uh in the detroit public schools um that has afforded me the opportunity to have uh other opportunities that people uh quite frankly from my neighborhood didn't have and don't have um I grew up in an era um, of uh, the crack e epidemic um, that had almost obliterated the city, um, particularly my neighborhood. So it, it gave me at least some perspective about uh, poverty, uh, economics, um, who um, has access and, and doesn't have access to health care. Um, like I said, different opportunities. I played the cello and, and, and violin <laughs> and a dude growing up on the west side in the hood, you know, bringing the cello home every day. It just... I love it. I love that image. I love it. <laughs> you For can imagine I, get picked, I got picked with, right? <laughs> yes, you did. I wasn't there, but I know you did. Right. <laughs> but, um, you know, part of what we want to do is we want to create a world where that doesn't happen, where the, the, the cellists in the hood are just as revered as, uh, you know, others who, who, you know, who, who, who we might idolize, so to speak. Um, and so all of those experiences, I believe, help to drive me as an educator to make sure that um, um, we could use uh, the institution of school as the vehicle to to uh, bring equity to our society, to to bring equality to our society, to to help to rid ourselves of this plague that we call racism. Um, I think schools can be on the forefront of doing that. And so, um, again, I learned those things very early on to uh, put my energy into um, making schools better. Uh, as a means to to make making our city better and making our state and nation better. And to that end, you are the director. What's your your current job title? You are my current job title is assistant superintendent for diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, for Farmington Public Schools. Um, so I serve in that role um, along with uh, doing a couple of other things. I do a little bit of uh, consulting outside. Um, uh, around issues of uh, equity and literacy uh, based off of um, a recent book that I wrote. Right, and, right. I love the title of your book. The, the title of your book, tell, tell it to us. Uh, it's, the title of the book is A Walk in Their Kicks, Literacy, Identity, and the Schooling of Young Black Males. And um, 
I called it that for a couple of different reasons. One, that it's um, necessary for us to, um, you know, if for a short time walk in the shoes of um, our students, particularly our African-American students, um, to get a perspective of the relationship between African-American students and school, um, the perspective of the historical implications of schooling for, um, for those uh, young men and women. Um, and another reason why I call it a walk in their kicks is because um, it opens up with this story about a young man who tried to rob me of my shoes and um, um, my one, the wondering that I've had for most of my life since then is whether or not uh, he felt he would be someone different if he could walk in my shoes, if he could have a pair of um, the Adidas top 10 um, high tops that he was trying to, <laughs> that he was trying to take off my feet. Right. So, um, you know, so the book is um, a, a short um, a foray into um, what schools could be um, if we had more uh, people walking in the shoes of uh, those who've been historically uh, oppressed in this country. Um, so that idea of walking in shoes, we're seeing, and we chatted a little bit before we started recording, we're seeing mobilization of all types of people who seemingly are, are just now seeing what other people are walking through. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you could talk a little bit about some of how you're feeling, because we got the educator and the words and the books, but the very mm -hmm. real experience of, of how is this feeling and what are you thinking as a, as a human being? Uh, that's a great question. So I'm hoping that it's real and, and it, it, it's real. It, it, yes, it's real. But what I mean by real is that um, that it is a conversation that continues. Um, I am hopeful that um, people and it, it, it tragically took to took the death of people like George Floyd and Sandra Bland and um, you know, Trayvon Martin to to begin to wake people up. It took those it took those tragedies to to be able to wake people up. But I'm hoping hoping that it's not just a, a, a temporary uh, awakeness, if you will. Um, and so uh, um, I'm I'm feeling hopeful, but I'm also feeling like um, that. W the, the conversations that we have have to lead to some sort of driving change, some policy change, some um, some uh, change of minds and change of hearts. You know, these conversations can't just be just be protesting in there and everybody puts their signs down and goes home. Right. Uh, the protests are important. Don't get me wrong. And I'm glad they're happening. But um you know, I want to see those conversations trickle down into schools. I want to see those conversations trickle down into to the boardrooms of corporations. I want to see those conversations trickle down into the legislature. Um, and I know some different different uh, states are passing um, proclamations uh, stating that they are um, anti-racist or they are uh, moving toward more anti-racist uh, policies, but. Um, we need to see that um, that trickle down into American society, like, you know, people calling out racist acts when they see them. Um, those are the types of changes we, we like to see. You like to see um, more more uh, people stepping up and risking risking some things that um, they might not ordinarily risk, like some of these media personalities or some of these entertainers who are, you know, in some cases, billionaires like do you have nothing to lose if you get behind this movement? <laughs> like, right. So, so, you know, I, um, I'm not quite a billionaire yet. Yeah. Not <laughs> me, me either. <laughs> so, I know that you have started holding some town halls virtually for, for people uh, that we work with, with our colleagues around yeah. some issues. I know there's a book study coming out. Yes. And I, I also want, I want to preface this question with saying, I know it is not your job as a black person to tell me, a white person, what I should do next. Right, right. Know that. Yes. At the same time, I have friends and people who comment and, and DM me and they're like, okay, what do I do next? Mm -hmm. Because I really don't know. This is new. And, yeah. and 
it's a lot of great memes like, oh, congratulations on right. realizing what happened. Like, you know, and that the, the word woke is really yeah. a curious term because right. it gets thrown around as hashtag. But the reality is to be woke is to assume that at one point you were sleeping. Yes. Right. And you have awoken. Right. So people are wrestling with my next steps. I made my sign. I went out. I donated. What could a person expect from a school district? What what could they do in their circle of friends? What are the the, the sometimes risky actions of an ally that mm-hmm. You're trying to build in the school district, in your in your circle, as well as people could say, I, I want that in my circle. I want that in my district. I want that where I work. Mm-hmm. What what are some things that you've seen work or that are, you know, I'm not going to use the word reasonable. What are the demands? Like, what, what should people be looking to do now? That's, uh, wow, that's a great <laughs> question. <It's> like, <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so I, I always compare... Um, when I'm asked a question like, what what would you do in your professional life or what would you do for this scenario? I always compare that to what would I expect from any other relationship? Um, what would I expect from um, a relationship with my wife or with my kids or with um, uh, close family members? Um, and, and I say this, there, there, are, there are some pretty solid cornerstones of every relationship, you know, trust, communication, um, consistency. Um, so what I would ask, uh, uh, self-reflection, um, what I would ask, uh, people to do is to really start with this self-reflective process, um, and looking at, um, what their core beliefs are, um, how they have either, uh, been, uh, been a part of, um, the oppression of people of color, what they've done and what they've neglected to do. Um, and then, um, you know, how, how to move forward. What, what, what are some um, really um, uh, doable first steps? You know, so in, in um, you know, so I'll, I'll, I'll use a personal example. Um, I like to debate um, and my wife doesn't. Um, and so b- because it was something that I wanted to do all the time, it, it often would turn into argument. Um, so what I would have to do, um, would be to do some self-reflection about what she needed and what she wanted in that particular, particular scenario. Um, we didn't, you know, we stopped, um, uh, all of the debates and, 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 and had more, um, you know, open and real conversation. So I had to do some self-reflection about, um, and I've had this conversation with my son recently, um, learning the different love languages of people um, to, to secure and to strengthen a relationship. You, to a particular, at a, at a particular point, you have to deny yourself and think about the needs of the other person. And so when I think about the educators that I work with, um, one of the first things that I would ask them to do is not necessarily deny deny themselves, but um, really concentrate on what the needs are of their students, particularly their African American students. Um, what are some of the things that you know you specifically and intentionally have to do to to uh, to lift up and value uh, the most marginalized voices? Um, I would ask uh, some folks who say, what do I do next? Um, continue to educate yourselves. Um, read. There there are tons of books. Um, the book study that we're going to do is How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibrahim X. Kendi. Um, and, you know, it's not the only book, but it's one that uh, I thought might be a good starting point. Um, White Fragility is a great starting point. Um, you yeah. know, for that book is fire. <laughs> it absolutely is. It absolutely is. Absolutely is. Um, you know, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria by Beverly Dan- Daniel Tatum is a good book um, to start if you're, if you're seeking to um, uh, find out, um, you know, why, why kids of color in public schools um, need that affinity. Um, they're... they're 
So doing some self-discovery, self-education, I would say would be the first steps. And then they would help to lead to other steps, other action steps, because those books have some um, really key things in them that, you know, could suggest those things. Wonderful. Wonderful. So I will drop the titles of all those books in the about here. Um, mm -hmm. And I know that the resources that Naomi Khalil shared in my previous episode, um, that Google Doc, the doctoral students did, the on-roads, so you can kind of the, the, yeah. the make great place to kind of gauge yourself. Yeah. So you talk about very often, as, as long as I know you, being a father, being mm -hmm. a parent. So if you don't mind me asking, how how is parenting right now in a family with black children? How, what's, what, what is that experience like for, for you and for them? And, and could you share some of that with us who don't yeah. have? Absolutely. Um, it has been a constant, um, you know, as a parent, we're we're already con we're, we're already teaching our kids all the time. Every we look at every moment as a as a teaching and learning experience. Like, <laughs> fine, this is a really terrible thing for, for all of us. For anyone absolutely, who absolutely, cancel right. Absolutely, um, and this is no different. Um, this is um, this moment in time is no different. Um, so. <clears throat> One of the questions my son asked when um, George Floyd was first killed was, why don't we take a tally of all of the people that police kill and go and go tell someone? And um, <clears throat> it's a very practical solution to the problem, right? Like good data, <laughs> right? <laughs> Absolutely. And we tell them that if something is wrong, you go, you go let the proper authorities know, you know, if um, someone is bullying you or someone is, you know, acting in a certain way to go. So he was essentially living into living up to and living into what we've asked him to do his whole, his whole life. Um, and, and I had to explain to him that it wasn't just that simple. It wasn't um, as simple as going and letting someone know, because in his mind, there, there's always someone else holding someone accountable. And so he his question was, then who holds the United States accountable for how they've been treating um, black people all of these years? And I said, essentially, no one um, has has because, you know, as a, as a world, quote unquote, superpower, who's going to who's going to hold you accountable for anything that you do? Um right. And so my conversations with him have had had to be um, historical in nature, um, talking about the years, years and years and years of protest and struggle um, that black people have had to uh, endure. Um, my daughters, um, I do it uh, with them um, sort of long distance because both have moved out. So I kind of uh, keep in touch with them. Um, on a daily basis just to uh, keep up with them. You know, like I said, when, when each, because they're away, I don't know every time they leave the house. So it's, it's almost like, um, you know, I want to say I'm more relieved, but I, I you know, I am, um, I, I don't worry as much because they, you know, I don't know every time they're leaving the house. So it's, it's not, it's not as worrisome, but every time my son who's still at home leaves the house, and says, I'm going to go for a bike ride, or I'm going to ride my bike up to the store, or I want to ride my bike over to my friend's house, you know, those sorts of things. I think about those images of people just doing very simple things, like, I'm just going to go out for a jog. I'm going to go out and get some Skittles from the 7-Eleven. I'm going to, you know, those images uh, crop up for me. And so, it, you know, I know we can't, shelter our children for their whole lives but i really you know um i get worried every time you know uh one of them leaves the house or at least when he leaves the house because you know i'm worried that someone's going to do something uh, to my beautiful child and so um that's been tough and so i've probably been a, a little bit more um uh overbearing <laughs> than i already had been <laughs> <laughs> yeah. turn it up a couple of notches um but i just want i, I want uh them to really understand um the you know what what, ha what has happened with uh african-american people and to be uh, careful and vigilant and and continue to be themselves but 
get home safely and alive. I mean, that's. Yeah, I appreciate you you sharing that with us and saying, um, you you mentioned a meme when we were prepping a little bit, and it, you said, it, "What was it? It took protests, in American City, Elmo, yeah. and who else to finally and Spider-Man. Spider-Man. <laughs> to finally get people to pay attention." The yeah. meme I keep seeing in different variants is, "I can't wait for the U.S. to invade the U.S. to bring us democracy." Oh wow. And, and and variants, I'm like, if you saw this in another country, you know we'd be going over. But right. you can't. And and who who's who's gonna invade us? Um, right. And and it, no one. So we're gonna have to do it ourselves. Right. Um. So, Aaron, any last thought? Any anything you think people should hear, or you or a question you want to ask? Like, I, I want to give you our, our final say here. Any thoughts as we wrap this up? Um, I I just want to say um, that our enemy here is not, it's gonna be like cliche, so forgive me, um, but our enemy here is not each other. Our enemy, our enemy here is uh, white supremacy. Our enemy here is racism. Our enemy is um, inequality and inequity. Our, you know, those are our enemies. And so, um, you know, I, I think we, we as a country have to begin to dismantle this construct called race because it was, it was um, really constructed to, to um, divide us as people. Um, it was really constructed to create uh, different economic classes. Um, it was constructed to, um, uh, to keep this, this system of slavery, slavery going on for perpetuity. Um, and so um, as we as we deconstruct um, these um, socioeconomic lines, um, these 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 racial lines, these gender lines, we need to we need to continue to remember that that we are all human beings that want to see this country um, be better, and it can only be better when we push together, when we do protest, when we do demand, when we do vote, um, when we do use uh, and exercise um our our our, our guy given rights um along with our civil rights that um the constitution is supposed to uphold so um we the people of the united states have to push those things forward because they're not freedom is not just going to be given that freedom is won through protest so it's going to take us to be able to do that perfect well thank you for helping articulate that so beautifully for sharing your experience with your family and, and all the work that you're doing uh, for all of us as we work together on this. Um, I'm going to put your social media down uh, in the about part of this episode. Uh, awesome. So if you know more about this, you can reach out to Dr. Aaron Johnson. Uh, it's a Walt Whitman quote is the reference in your Twitter handle, right? I too sing America. The, um, it's Walt from Whitman, I sing America. And then who is the response? What's, what's the reference there? The, that reference is uh, a poem um, um, that was uh, written by Langston Hughes. Ah, of course. Okay. Called, called yeah, he, I, I Too. Yes. And um, as Walt Whitman's very nineteen, very early, early last century singing of America from yeah. the voice. Yeah. Of white, and then Langston. Well, not Langston Hughes these days. I think that's a, a good place for us all to be starting. So yes, I will put that in there. You can see that Dr. Johnson and I get pretty nerdy when English comes up. Yes, we do. Here's <laughs> an old poetry, and you'll get us going. Um, Absolutely. If you like this, or if you have messages for myself or for Dr. Johnson, you can comment in the episode below. We'd love for you to subscribe. And more than anything, um, these are the episodes I'm hoping people are sharing in your social media. Uh, and if you're thinking to yourself, like, I don't know if people should see this, then you absolutely should. That little voice um, tells you that there's probably people in your network who need to hear this. And if it's uncomfortable for them, we only grow sometimes through growing pains. So I encourage you to share widely. And uh, and thank you for your time for watching, for tuning in. Dr. Johnson, thank you very much. Aaron, I'm hoping I'll see you soon around about in the Farmington yes. area or Detroit, wherever it may be. Thanks very much. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Now the awkward time when I stop recording.